Hello Curious Minds, I'm Miles Maxer and welcome back to the Ant Network. And this is the second installment of our new Q&A series, where I answer your questions about ants and ant keeping. By the way, if you have any questions, make sure to head over to our social media accounts and send them our way. We'll do our best to answer your inquiries in a future episode. This week's first question comes to us from at Lindsay Waddles, who asks, what do ants do in the winter, Miles? Well, Lindsay, winter is a tough time for many animal species. A classic example of a survival strategy would be how bears go into a state of inactivity and metabolic depression called hibernation. Although ants and other insects change their behavior and physiology during winter, this is called diapause or dormancy, not hibernation. Basically, this means that ants have a reduced metabolic state during the winter. So they're using less energy, they're uh, far less active, they're not going about their daily tasks with nearly the same activity as they would in the spring, summer, and fall. Some ants even produce antifreeze-like compounds called glycerol, and that keeps the water molecules in their blood, or hemolymph, from freezing and killing them during the winter. In tropical areas, the ants don't really have this problem, but they may enter a state of quiescence during the dry season, but let's talk about that in a future episode. Thanks so much for your question. Ant Myrmacophilus asks, how do you find societal relevance for entomological research? Well, it turns out insects have huge impacts, not only on our societies, but on our day-to-day -day lives. And one of the largest ways is in agriculture, so our production of food. Insects have a really significant influence over our ability to have high crop yields to feed a growing global population. So the research that is done by entomologists on crop pests is directly linked to human health. Speaking of human health, one in six people around the world are impacted by an insect-borne disease. So the research that we do to prevent and control insect-borne diseases is very important to those people. Now, finally, the biological research that's been done on insects is also incredibly important to the advancement of our knowledge uh, of biology and just science in general. Much of what we know about modern genetics comes from work on fruit flies. And frankly, ants have had a huge impact on our engineering projects around the world. So there's a lot of different ways that insects are relevant to our daily lives, and many, many good reasons to provide excellent funding sources for entomologists. So if you have any funding, uh, let me know. If you're interested in learning more about the importance of insects and insect research, you can visit the Entomological Society of America's website. We've got a link down in the description. At Frankodzilla asks, why do queen ants die from fungal infections and parasites? Well, I know how frustrating it is to have a prized queen ant seem just fine, and then before you know it, she's on her back with fungus erupting out of her. That can be incredibly frustrating. Opportunistic fungi just exist in the environment and sometimes infiltrate their way into an ant's body. It might lay there, kind of underlying, and waiting for a health issue where it might take advantage of that and actually cause the ant to die. More lethal fungi uh, can actually just kill the ants outright. An example of this is cordyceps in the rainforest. Now, cordyceps is highly contagious amongst ants, and what it'll do is it'll infiltrate the ant's body and actually kind of take over its mind and direct it to go up vegetation, where inside of its head capsule, there will be a fruiting body that erupts out of it. Usually they're pretty colorful too, and it disperses spores through the environment, causing more ants to be infected by it. Luckily, cordyceps doesn't impact a lot of ant keepers, but it's definitely an interesting thing that we have found, mostly in, in tropical places. When it comes to parasites, there's the big three that we usually have to worry about for ant keeping. Those are flies, wasps, and mites. Now, flies and wasps will generally lay eggs or a set of eggs on a queen ant or even inside of her, and the larvae that hatch out of them will infiltrate the queen's body, consume its nutrients, and eventually cause it to die. They will then come out of the queen's body, pupate, and that whole life cycle will continue on and they'll go and infect other queen ants. When it comes to mites, that is a completely different situation. It's kind of like how a tick might latch onto your family dog and drink its blood. Well, 
parasitic mites will latch on to ants, usually somewhere where there's a seam where it can actually get its mouth parts in to extract hemolymph, and it will live off of that. In captivity, that can be a serious issue. I won't go into how to diagnose it in this episode, but if you're interested, let us know. At Myrmidon Nation Ants asks, what is the most important tool for an ant keeper to have in the field? That's a pretty difficult question if you're gonna ask me to narrow it down to a single tool, so I'm gonna show you my top three. First up, we have featherweight forceps. You can get these off of Bioquip or Tar Heel Ants. These are fantastic. It's a really thin metal, and what you can do is you can even pick uh, ants or their brood up with these without being concerned that you might squish them. If you insert your finger right in that seam, this is a, this is a myrmecologist trick, you can get it super, super precise. Absolutely a 10 out of 10. Make sure you have a couple pairs of these in your pack at all times. Next up, we've got snap cap vials. These are the perfect vials for collecting ants. They don't have a screw lid where you might pinch an ant's leg or hurt it in some way. Simple snap cap vial, 10 out of 10. Absolutely recommend you have a couple of these in your pack at all times. And of course, the trusty sidekick to your vials would be an aspirator. If you want to learn more about insect aspirators, we have a tutorial on our YouTube channel. Go ahead and check that out, and when you do, make sure you subscribe. Thanks so much for this question. At Army of Insects asks, what should high schoolers who are interested in a career in entomology do before college? Well, first off, there's no perfect answer to this question, and there's no set of things that you must complete while you're a high schooler if you're going to be an entomologist, but there are a few different things that you can do to prepare yourself for a college career in entomology or even just biology. And one of those is to join student organizations at your high school related to the sciences. Sometimes you'll have like a life science club. You may even be able to found an entomology club if you think there's sufficient interest, but it's really good to be a part of a broader community. Speaking of communities, the Entomological Society of America actually allows high schoolers to join their ranks as a full-on student member, and that's something that I took advantage of when I was in high school, and I definitely recommend it for those of you who are particularly interested in a career in entomology. Other things you can do is have a little bit of an emphasis on STEM classes, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that will prepare you for a STEM career in college. And you can also get involved on citizen science platforms like iNaturalist. So there's a lot of different strategies that you can take to try and kind of get a leg up or at least feel comfortable in the field of entomology before you go into college. All of that being said, you don't have to feel like you need to do anything. Just coming to college, having curiosity, being interested in learning is absolutely enough. And you should be prepared that your plans may change over time. And that wraps up our second Q&A. Thank you for the great questions and thank you for watching. Stay safe, everybody. Snow again.